my name is Rachel and this episode is viruses. There's a link in the description to the Pathfinder Honor requirements. I am not talking about them in order, so if you want to keep up and follow along, there is a letter and or number in the bottom of the screen with the requirement we are currently on. A virus is a tiny submicroscopic infectious agent. And the word is from Latin referring to a poison or other noxious liquids and was first used to describe what caused infectious diseases in 1728, long before the discovery of viruses in 1892 by Dmitry Ivanovsky, who was studying infected tobacco plants and suggested the infection might be caused by a toxin produced by bacteria, but did not pursue the idea. Plus, he was wrong anyway, but good effort. So in 1898, a Dutch microbiologist named Martinus Biernik repeated Dimitri's experiments, did more research, and reintroduced the word virus by naming what infected the tobacco plants the tobacco mosaic virus. For over a hundred years, the scientific community has repeatedly changed its mind over what viruses are, first seen as a poison, then as life forms, then as biological chemicals, to viruses are alive. No, they're not. Well, yes, they are, and back and forth and back and forth. Today, viruses are kind of in a gray area of living and non-living. This is why they're not in any of the scientific kingdoms of living things. Life is complicated, and living things have a complicated structure. Smaller building blocks come together to form one larger product. A single virus particle is known as a virion and is made up of a set of genes bundled within a protective protein shell called a capsid. This outer green part is called an envelope and I will tell you more about that in a minute. Way back in scientific writings, one of the requirements for life was that living things must be made up of cells. The red part is a cell, and all the little yellow guys are virions. They are so tiny. Viruses are definitely not made up of cells, so guess they're not alive. But wait, viruses reproduce. If a single virion entered your body, no problem. Your immune system could knock it out without you even knowing it was there. But these little guys reproduce, or rather replicate, by the hundreds of thousands in a very short time. The term replicate is used because living things grow. Viruses don't have what they need to copy their genes, much less reproduce whole new virions. Instead, viruses enter living cells, then hijack the host's cellular equipment to copy viral genetic information, build new capsids, and assemble everything together. Which means each virion is created in its fully formed state and will not increase in size or in complexity throughout its existence. For some viruses, at the time when they are between host cells, the capsid is enveloped with a lipid bilayer that contains viral proteins, usually including proteins that enable the virus to bind to a host cell. The lipid bilayer is also somewhat derived from the host cell's membrane. This lipid and protein structure is called an envelope, and a well-known virus that is like this is the coronavirus. Living things use energy. Creating new virion units is a major undertaking. From building nucleic acids to putting capsids together, that takes a lot of energy. Viruses can't make energy on their own. All of the energy that goes into the construction of new virions comes from the host cell. Viruses steal it by latching on to the cell's metabolism. Sometimes the host cell doesn't have enough energy or supplies to fully support the virus. So, Viruses need to be able to adapt to different environments, which is something living things do. A virus can live in two different phases. The lytic phase, where the virus actively replicates in a host cell, and the lysogenic phase, where the virus incorporates its viral DNA into the cell's DNA and multiplies whenever the cell multiplies. The virus can eventually re-enter the lytic phase when conditions are right. This ability to adapt is what makes some viruses so hard to treat. For example, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV AIDS, mutates quickly because it makes frequent mistakes while replicating. It's the little green specks. Because the virus is constantly changing, it makes it very hard to design drugs and vaccines to fight against it. One drug might prevent a large number from replicating, but some will be unaffected and continue to replicate new resistant viral strains. Resistant strains are becoming more and more common because so many people are taking antiviral drugs, even for things like heart and liver transplants. So we know viruses aren't dead, <laughs> they're certainly doing something. But are they living? 
Viruses are more like robots than real living organisms. They don't have cells, they can't grow, and they can't make their own energy. They have to rely on a host cell to build and power themselves. Viruses and subviral particles are all categorized as non-living infectious agents. There are two types of subviral particles. Viroids, not to be confused with virions, and prions, not to be confused with this Australian bird. Viroids are the smallest infectious pathogen known and are made up of a single strand of circular RNA. Up until recently, viroids were thought to only infect plants, but we now know that they are partially what causes hepatitis D, which causes liver problems. Prions have no genetic material, that means no DNA or RNA. They are only made up of proteins. A normal protein is generally folded like this, and abnormal proteins tend to be like this. It is thought that both these proteins are made of the same amino acids, just in different shapes. When an abnormal protein comes in contact with a normal protein, it will change that normal protein to become abnormal as well. And as more and more get changed, they create protein deposits. Your body will naturally clean out these protein deposits, leaving holes where cells should be. This makes your insides kind of look like a sponge. Diseases caused by prions, like mad cow disease, usually occur in the brain of mammals, and this is deadly. Scientists don't really know much about prions yet, so there are no cures. And there is still a lot we don't know about viruses either, but there has been a lot more success treating them. When a disease stops circulating in a specific region, it is considered eliminated in that region. For example, polio was eliminated in the United States in 1979 after widespread vaccination efforts. If a particular disease is eliminated worldwide, it is considered eradicated. In 1980, after decades of effort by the World Health Organization, smallpox was declared eradicated and, as of today, is the only eradicated infectious disease that affects humans. Actually, the first vaccine ever administered was for smallpox. Antibiotics do nothing for fighting viruses. They are for fighting bacteria. There are a few antiviral drugs available, but the most effective weapon that medical science has developed for fighting viruses is vaccines. We also know that living according to the laws of health God has given us will make our immune system stronger to do its job of killing off viruses that invade our body. Even just simple hygiene like washing your hands will play a huge part in helping you stay well. When the body senses foreign substances, called antigens, your immune system works to recognize these antigens and get rid of them. B lymphocytes, or B cells, which are small white blood cells, are triggered to make antibodies. These specialized proteins lock onto specific antigens and destroy them. And the antibodies will then stay in a person's body. So, if your immune system encounters the same antigen again, the antibodies are ready to do their job. Vaccines work by training your immune system to recognize and fight viruses or bacteria. Though, in more recent times, the safety of some vaccines have been questioned, so always do your research before letting someone inject something into your body. By injecting small amounts of the virus into your body through a vaccine, your immune system will learn what the bad guys look like and produce antibodies, which are kind of like little soldiers, to defend your body against the hostile invaders. There are currently three types of vaccines for viruses. Subunit conjugate vaccines. For some diseases, scientists are able to isolate a specific protein from the virus that can train your immune system to react without provoking sickness. Live attenuated vaccines, which introduce your body to a weakened form of the virus that is too weak to spread. And inactivated vaccines inject a completely dead virus. Your immune system can still learn how to fight the live virus from the shape of the dead one. Viruses come in many different shapes and sizes, which are called morphologies, and are classified into four main groups. Filamentous, isometric, enveloped, and head and tail. Filamentous viruses are long and cylindrical, and this group includes the tobacco mosaic virus we talked about earlier. Isometric viruses have shapes that are roughly spherical, such as the herpes simplex virus. Head and tail viruses infect bacteria. 
They have a head that is similar to isometric viruses and a tail that is shaped like filamentous viruses. And they're kind of freaky looking. The last group is enveloped, which I told you about earlier. Enveloped viruses are the ones whose capsids are enveloped in membranes. For example, the varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox, which is a rash disease, or exanthematous disease. So are rubella and measles. All three are contagious and have similar symptoms, and there are vaccines developed to fight against them. The easiest way to tell the difference between the three is by the way they look. Rubella can spread through the air by respiratory droplets caused by sneezing or coughing, or through direct contact with saliva. So don't go kissing an infected person, or even drinking from their water bottle or sharing a lip balm. Symptoms include fever, achiness, enlarged neck lymph nodes, eye redness, headaches, runny nose, and a red rash. Rubella is pretty rare and is considered eliminated in the United States. Plus, a rubella infection is mild for most people, but it could cause birth defects in an unborn baby. Measles also spread through the air by coughing and sneezing and by touching infected saliva, but they can also spread by shaking an infected person's hand or even touching a doorknob after them. But don't go becoming a complete germaphobe. Measles are quite rare. Some common symptoms are runny nose, inflamed eyes, sore throat, fever, and a red blistery rash. Measles are serious in small children and can even spread to unborn babies through their mothers. Chickenpox is the most common of these three viruses, but is still pretty rare these days. It can spread in the same way as measles, plus the itchy blister-like rash oozes liquid that is contagious. Some common symptoms are red spots, fever, loss of appetite, and swollen lymph nodes. So many viruses have the same symptoms, and it can be really hard to know what you have. It is difficult or even impossible to tell the difference between a common cold and the flu without being tested. Both are respiratory illnesses and share many of the same symptoms. Flu symptoms can include fever, chills, sore throat, runny nose, headaches, muscle and body aches, and tiredness. Colds can have the same symptoms, but they are generally milder than the flus. Colds usually do not result in serious health issues, but the flu can. Most people with the flu will fully recover within a couple weeks, but some will develop complications like pneumonia or a bunch of other things that could go wrong, some ending in death, though. We know death is not the end. Colds are caused by more than 200 types of viruses, the most common being the rhinovirus. And the flu is caused by the influenza virus. Influenza mutates and has hundreds of different virus strains with slight changes in the surface binding proteins that can make them unrecognizable by your body's immune system. Flu vaccines are developed with educated guesses as to which flu strains will spread most that season, and sometimes the guesses are wrong. Flu season, or as I call it, don't eat at Taco Bell season, is when a specific flu strain breaks out into an epidemic spreading through one or several countries. And a flu pandemic is a worldwide outbreak like the Spanish flu. <laughs> Even the cat is wearing a mask. Or the Asian flu, or the Hong Kong flu, or the swine flu. You know, we wouldn't have to deal with any of these submicroscopic viruses that wreak so much havoc if it were not for sin. The Bible says that heaven will be a place with no more sickness and death, and that is something I look forward to. I hope you have learned something. Until next time, keep a song in your heart.